Well, thanks for inviting me here. Sorry I couldn't make it down to Imperial College in person. Um, I'm going to talk a bit today about sustainable lubricants. Uh, my name's Ian Taylor. I am uh, work now part-time at the University of Central Lancashire. And um, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, here's an overview. Um, I was asked to put two slides together about my personal career journey, which I've done. And then I'm going to talk a bit about uh, sustainable lubricants, uh, give an introduction, talk about the concept of circular economy, talk about how lubricants are used to improve energy efficiency and extend machine life, look at the CO2 impact of lubricants, um, discuss where bio-based lubricants fit into all this, and other technologies for improving lubricant sustainability, and then, then conclude. So in terms of my career in tribology, um, I actually didn't start in tribology. I got a degree in physics um, back in 18, 1984, and then I did a PhD actually in semiconductor physics in 1987, uh, which was a case award sponsored by British Telecom. Um, but for various reasons, I ended up getting a job uh, working for Plessy Research, which was an electronics company, and I worked in the theory group. So I was mainly modeling um, waves propagating through semiconductor waveguides and optical fibers and looking at low noise transistors. And then in 1991, Plessy was taken over by GEC, uh, which didn't have a very good reputation as an employer. So I looked to, to move jobs and I ended up getting a job with Shell Research, um, which um, the research lab at the time was based up near Chester in Ellesmere Port. Um, and uh, I got recruited into a mathematical modeling group that Shell had at the time. And I got into tribology really by being asked as one of my first tasks to develop a model and software uh, to predict the film thickness and the friction uh, of piston rings. And the, um, because of this was uh, for the Shell lubricants business, um, I put a lot of effort into getting good lubricant properties into the software. And at the time, the software was written in Fortran, which shows you how long ago it was. Um, but at the time I did this work, there's a lot of interest in energy efficient lubricants. And so I ended up moving to the lubricants group. Um, and I did other work looking at friction in bearings and valve trains. And then I became a project leader on various projects looking at energy efficient lubricants. And um, I was doing um, leading projects, doing experimental work, as well as looking at improving the modeling. And then as I progressed through Shell, I became an innovation manager and we had an internal competition for uh, novel research ideas. And we could give uh, funds to those ideas and uh, progress them, hopefully, so they'd become bigger and then get funded by the main lubricants business. And throughout that period, I worked quite closely with a large number of universities on tribology projects. And then um, 2006, 2012, I was the technology manager for the Shell's lubrication science team, which was uh, included the UK team plus a group in the US in the Houston Center. Um, and then we reorganized slightly and we had a Shell Lubricants Discovery Hub that was developed and I moved over to that as a technology manager. Um, but all throughout my career, I also had quite a lot of external activities. So in the UK, there was an um, organization called the Energy Technology Institute, which was based at Loughborough. And they were looking at um, how the UK could reduce its carbon dioxide footprint. And I sat, sat on a, an advisory group looking at CO2 reductions in heavy duty vehicles, which were basically buses, on road and off road heavy duty vehicles and ships. And also from 2017 to 2020, I, I came down to Imperial College quite a bit because uh, I was the interface at that time for the um, uh, Shell Imperial College University Technology Center. Um, I became a fellow of the Institute of Physics in 2018 and also a fellow of the STLE in 2019. And I, I was fortunate enough to win a IMEC e Silver Medal for Tribology in 2020. Um, I then left uh, Shell in 2020, um, partly due to COVID, um, because uh, in 2020 it, it had a massive impact on the oil and gas industry. So they were looking people, for people to volunteer to take um, early retirement. So I, I took that opportunity. And then soon after, I got asked to be a visiting professor at UCLan, University of Central Lancashire in Preston. And I now do some part time research uh, on tribology projects funded by um, a Japanese organization, the TTRF. So I've, I've 
published quite a lot of papers, mainly on energy efficient lubricants um, and engine friction. And I regularly attend uh, conferences in the UK and abroad. So that, that's a bit about me. So happy to answer any questions later on in the careers bit about that. Um, but I'll now go, go over to the sustainable lubricants bit. So I, I've just uh, here pulled a, quite a few comments from various published papers in the tribology literature. Um, and hopefully if any of you students are, are working in this area, you, you won't write things like this <laughs> because of, often you get some uh, statements like this, which are made in papers with no references and uh, quite broad um, sweeping statements, which don't really stand up to scrutiny. Um, so for example, on the left, uh, someone here is saying about um, lubricants which have sulfur, phosphorus, zinc are environmentally polluting. Um, and for, for a start with ZDTP, uh, as far as I'm aware, the, the additives should stay on the surfaces inside the machine they are, should, they should never really come out and they get used up during the oil drain interval. And I think um, the only reason people would say they're environmentally polluting in engines is that with after treatment devices that um, are used to control NOx and particulate emissions from exhaust pipes, sulfur and phosphorus can block up those uh, after treatment devices. So they could potentially affect the NOx and particulate emissions. But what's happened is the lubricant companies have actually adapted and reduced the uh, amount of sulfur and phosphorus in their formulations so that these things don't block up. And you could argue that if you um, if you completely ban something like ZDTP, the amount of wear you would get and the reduction in machine life would mean you'd have to make a lot more machines to replace the ones which failed early. And that would probably be more environmentally um, damaging than simply continuing to use ZDTP. So there's lots of statements around which are quite narrow and one of the things I'd like to you to encourage is to think about the whole life cycle of the lubricant and the machine in assessing how well the lubricant behaves. Um, now, if we look at um, oil and gas, which a lot of lubricants come from nowadays, um, one of the facts that isn't well appreciated is that only 1% of a barrel of oil is used to make lubricant base oils and 80% over 80, 80 to 85% of a barrel oil is used to make liquid fuels. So you can look at this in two ways. One way is to, um, is to think about um, if you suddenly replaced all of the um, lubricants in the world, which come from oil and gas with say biodegradable oils, it's not actually going to affect the, um, the amount of oil and gas needed by the worldwide, you're only going to reduce the demand by 1%. And the other way of looking at it is if you can manage to reduce the liquid fuels coming from a barrel of oil, uh, potentially the amount of oil we've got would enable you to continue to make lubricants for maybe hundreds or thousands of years um, because we're, we're using so little of it. Now, the circular economy is quite important, and this is certainly somewhere where the lubricants business can improve dramatically. So every year, about 40 million tonnes of lubricants are used worldwide. Um, and of that, about between a half and one million tonnes come from bio-based lubricants. So they come from uh, crops that are grown. Um, but only two million tonnes come from recycled used oils. So if you look at this um, circular economy, 95% of the materials to make lubricants is made new every year. Um, now, the lubricants industry and the um, machine manufacturers have been making great strides to reduce the amount of oil in machines. So the sump volume is going down. We're looking at producing energy efficiency, uh, energy efficient lubricants. So the amount of energy used by the machine is going down as well. And we're also increasing the oil drain interval. So all these uh, contribute to the circular economy by meaning that we're using less lubricants. But with not collecting and re-refining used oils enough, there's only about 5% of um, re-refined base oils come into the system. So there is the potential to effectively collect much more used oils and then uh, process it and re-refine it to make new base oils. And then we'd reduce how much uh, new material is used every year. And I should say, when we talk about collecting and re-refining used oils, we should also be looking at 
uh, collecting and re-refining used bio-based oils, not, not just mineral-based oils as well. Now, um, one thing that's worth emphasizing is that if we're working in the area of tribology and lubrication, it is already a very sustainable um, business to be in because most 90% uh, of the work done in tribology and lubricants is um, focused on reducing friction and reducing wear. So um, various studies have shown that almost 20% of the world's energy is used to overcome friction and about 6% is used to overcome wear. So if we can reduce friction and wear, you're reducing the energy that is used and you're, you're reducing the CO2 emissions. And if we're reducing wear, you're effectively enabling machines last, to last longer. And so the CO2 emitted during the manufacture of the machine is sort of um, averaged over a longer time period, which helps sustainability. And you're probably familiar with various studies looking at how much savings, financial savings, can be achieved by lubrication. So in the 60s, there was the JOST report, um, which found about 1.5% of global um, GDP global domestic product could be saved by using optimum lubricants. Now it's worth looking at this um, report in detail because this was at a time in the 60s when machines were fairly unreliable and the cost of energy was low. So what that report actually found was that most of the savings were, were due to reduced wear and reduced breakdowns and only 5% came from reducing friction. But if we move forward to uh, 2019, uh, we've now got very reliable machines in 2019, um, but we've got high energy costs. So the study uh, by Holmberg and Erdemir in 2019 found that most of the savings, 74% uh, of the savings from using optimised lubricants come, come from friction, and only 10% um, come from wear, 4% um, come from um, breakdowns. So it's changed quite a bit over the years. But somewhat surprisingly, Holmberg and Erdemir also reported that the cost savings were about one and a half percent of GDP. Um, and so for the UK, the GDP is about two trillion dollars. So by using the optimum lubricants for your application, you can potentially save 30 billion dollars um, annually in the UK alone. Um, so it's a sizable amount of financial savings. But you can also translate it that into how much CO2 you can save as well. So coming on to CO2, um, it's worth comparing the CO2 emissions associated with lubrication um, as compared to energy. So what I've done in this calculation here in the table is I've assumed that um, you've got four litres of an engine lubricant with a one year drain interval, uh, four years, four litres of transmission lubricant with a five year drain interval. And we're assuming that there's almost a thousand liters of gasoline used, um, which corresponds to about 10,000 miles of driving. So for a typical gasoline car, you can work out the CO2 emissions and about 144 grams per kilometer come from combustion of the fuel, about 37 grams per kilometer come from vehicle manufacture and 42 grams per kilometer come from the manufacture of gasoline. So in total, you get about 223 grams per kilometer of CO2 emitted. Whereas if we look at a typical UK battery vehicle, uh, the CO2 emissions come, are about 88 grams per kilometre, with about 40 grams per kilometre coming from the electricity supply based on an average UK uh, electricity distribution, and 48 grams per kilometre come from vehicle manufacture. Now, there's a couple of papers which have estimated how much CO2 emissions are associated with the manufacture and disposal of a synthetic lubricant, and I've used a figure of about three and a half kilograms per litre for the CO2 emissions associated with lubricants. And there's been work currently ongoing with the API and in Europe looking at better estimating the carbon footprint of lubricants. And a, a recent API um, document has come up with a figure of two kilograms per litre for a uh, lubricant that was 50% recycled. So the figure I'm using here is, is certainly the right ballpark. But if you if you put these numbers in, you find that for a gasoline car, there's about three and a half thousand kilograms of CO2 is associated with the um, combustion of gasoline and vehicle manufacture. Um, there's about 14 kilograms of CO2 associated with the lubricants used in the engine. 
and only 2.8 kilograms of CO2 associated with the transmission. The reason the transmission oil is much lower than the engine oil is simply because it's got a five year ordering interval. So the, the um, CO2 associated manufacture of the lubricant and disposal is averaged over five years. So it's five times less than that of the engine oil. And in the electric car, we've gone down from three and a half thousand kilograms of CO2 associated with the um, energy use and vehicle manufacture down to 1400 kilograms. And obviously there's no engine oil. Um, <laughs> so you can see from these figures that the CO2 emissions uh, in a vehicle are primarily coming from the energy use and the vehicle manufacture. And the CO2 emissions from the lubricant are essentially negligible. Although of course, you know, it's worthwhile reducing them still further. And this is just showing uh, how you can reduce the CO2 emissions further. So uh, this is um, a figure taken from the, the Grice paper. He's uh, calculated in this paper how much CO2 is associated with that extraction of crude oil, manufacture of um, the base oil and transportation to where it goes, which is the blue bit. And then the orange bit is waste disposal. So for a mineral oil, he's coming in with a figure of just under three kilograms per litre of CO2 emissions. For a synthetic oil, which has got more process in it, it's about three and a half kilograms um, per litre. But what's interesting is if you, uh, if you take waste oil and re-refine it, you can reduce the CO2 emissions quite substantially. And so one viable way of making lubricants much more sustainable is to make lubricants with large, longer oil drain intervals and re-refine them at the end of use uh, to make new base oils um, for new lubricants. So I've talked about sustainability, uh, sustainable lubricants so far. Where do biolubricants fit in? Um, and this is an area which is quite confusing um, because often in tribology papers, you see the words bio, sustainable and renewable, and they're often used interchangeably and without much explanation. Uh, but somewhat confusingly, you can have biodegradable base oils which don't contain any biocomponents and which aren't sustainable. So for example, polyalpha olefin based oils and some synthetic esters uh, are, can be classed as biodegradable, but like I say, they don't contain any biocomponents and they're, they're made from chemical processes which aren't sustainable. And also confusing uh, in the US, there is a class of lubricants named, known as bio-based, and they're just, they may not be that biodegradable. In fact, they're, they're the same class of biodegradability as normal mineral oils. Um, so there are tests um, that are available from the OECD or the CEC, uh, and they tell you how biodegradable lubricants are. And the two classes which are, are useful for customers are ultimately biodegradable, where virtually everything biodegrades, um, and those are lubricants which have special additives in and um, usually esters from natural sources as a base oil. Um, and then there's also the readily uh, biodegradable um, label. Um, and they're, I mean, lubricants are hydrocarbons, so they are inherently biodegradable, but that's a lower category. Um, but the thing is, uh, although there's a lot of work being done in tribology looking at biodegradable lubricants they're only really strictly needed where the lubricant is likely to um, uh, leak out of the machine so they're being used today um, in ships so in the ships that go into u.s waters have to use environmentally acceptable lubricants in the stern tube which is basically the propeller um, so the propeller is connected to a tube and there's a seal at the end and that lubricant could easily leak out into the ocean. So they want those lubricants to be environmentally acceptable. Um, other areas where biodegradable lubricants are used in Europe, um, in Scandinavia, they often use grease on railway lines, um, but they use biodegradable grease on those railway lines. And biodegradable lubricants are often used in forestry equipment uh, in Europe as well. But if you've got a machine in which the lubricant does not leak out, there's not really any benefit of using a biodegradable lubricant. Um, there's various uh, labeling schemes for biolubricants. So in the US, the bio-based label um, is here on the left-hand side, and you can also got the option of putting in the amount of biomaterial in there. Um, there are more strict 
biodegradable um, labels, so the Blue Angel and the Nordic Swan are much stricter than the bio-based label, and, and there's similar labels for Europe and Japan. And the basic idea of why biolubricants uh, are useful is that the two main ideas are that when you grow crops, um, CO2 is absorbed, and that that those that CO2 is, it, that is absorbed can offset any CO2 emissions that, that's produced during the manufacture of the lubricants. And clearly, these lubricants are also sustainable because instead of uh, drilling for oil and then processing it and then using it and then drilling for oil again, we can grow crops year after year. So it is definitely sustainable. But there are a few drawbacks to biolubricants which might, might not be appreciated. Um, if you actually have to clear land to grow the crops in the first place, a lot of CO2 is emitted and it can actually take many decades for that CO2 to be paid back. Uh, also in Europe, uh, the land that's being used for growing crops for biofuel or biolubricants, that's also in competition with land being used for food. And in fact, in Europe, if the um, land could have been used for food, you can't actually label those um, lubricants as sustainable. Um, another disadvantage of biolubricants is that uh, when you use when you make biofuel or biolubricants, you generally use large amounts of water, which is another scarce resort. And the final point that's worth making is even if you do have a biodegradable lubricant when it's fresh, uh, when it's been used in the machine for a year or however many years um, it's used for, the oil at the end of the drain period is not, certainly not biodegradable. And in most countries, it would be classed as hazardous waste and will still need disposing of or recycling in a similar way to other used lubricants. I mean, other things that the lubricants business is doing to become more sustainable, it's looking at the use of uh, recyclable plastic containers. Um, you might also have seen bag in a box type packaging like on the left hand side here. So this is a bit like a wine box. Um, so the, the cardboard is obviously recyclable and you don't have a, a heavy plastic container that you have to deal with. Um, and there's also bulk delivery and reusable lube cubes for, for large scale customers. So there's a lot of uh, attention being paid to uh, recyclable containers for lubricants. And also in the uh, blending plants where lubricants are blended up, uh, many companies, including Shell and Total, they're using solar panels or wind power for the electricity in those blending plants. And so Shell have reported that over 50% of electricity used in lubricant blending plants around the world is, is from renewable resources. And they've reduced CO2 emissions from manufacturing by 30% compared to 2016. Um, another area that is also active uh, is removal of toxic components from lubricants. So there, there are in different regions, there are different regulatory chemistry bodies. So in the EU, there is a body called REACH. In the US, they have something called TOSCA and the similar bodies in Japan and elsewhere. And the role of these bodies is that they want to check if the um, components going into a product are toxic or can change or, or, or um, bad for health, you know, like can cause cancer and stuff. And so if they if they find that some substances do um, cause issues, you have to put a skull and crossbones on the label on your product. And clearly, lubricant companies don't want to do that. So what happens is if uh, an additive is identified as being toxic, it is usually re removed and a different additive used in its place. And over the years, um, additives which used to be commonly used are, have been gradually removed from use. Um, so things like chlorinated paraffins and other chlorine containing additives, um, anti-wear additives used in the past called tricresol phosphate, um, antioxidants, heavy metals in general are being removed from things like greases and boron compounds are also being watched. And so um, there are both regulatory um, pushes for this and the lubricant industry itself is being proactive if they think something is likely to appear on this list they will take it out and just to finally I want to say I mean there's other things going on apart from um, biolubricants for example 
So there's a lot of interest in making hydrocarbons from waste. Uh, that could either be waste biomass or it could be waste plastic. And so Shell have a IH squared pilot plant in India is making uh, hydrocarbon fuel from waste biomass. And that in principle could also be used to make base oils. And there's research going on in other places where they're trying to make hydrocarbons from waste plastic. So, I mean, what I'm trying to get over hopefully today is that lubricant sustainability is a complex area. It's not simply a case that we need to move to biolubricants. And tribology and lubrication and lubricants is inherently a sustainable business because for the most part, we're working to reduce um, friction, which will reduce energy and also reduce wear. So that extends machine life. And both of those aims uh, will result in lower CO2 emissions. But it's also worth emphasizing that CO2 emissions from lubricants are much, much lower than the CO2 emissions emitted by the energy used by machines. But saying that, I mean, there's, we, we shouldn't be uh, complacent. We can always improve the performance of our lubricants. And there's a couple of ways to do this. One simple way is to make lubricants with a longer oil drain interval and make more effort to recycle used oils to make new base oils at the end of life. And the second way um, is to use bio-based lubricants where they're most appropriate. And that's mainly where um, the lubricant has a chance of leaking out into the environment. And there are also other things we can do uh, in terms of reducing the environmental footprint of lubricants, looking at uh, better packaging, um, using renewable electricity during manufacturing operations and looking at new technologies. So I mentioned hydrocarbons from waste, for example, but there's also work going on looking at water based lubricants. And there's also ongoing work looking at new additives as well. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an overview of what's going on uh, in terms of lubricant sustainability. And I'm happy to answer questions later um, or after with the talk, however um, it goes.